Hello everyone, my name is Elad Tabak and I'm a principal software engineer and team lead at Red Hat. I work on a product called uh, OpenShift Cluster Manager, or OCM for short. Uh, and some of the examples I'll be showing you in this presentation are taken from that product. Today I'd like to talk to you about something called developer experience. But first, let me share this. Uh, a few years ago, I went online on a social network and I saw this picture. And it really made me laugh. At the time, I was doing a transition from being a back-end developer to doing some more front-end work. I've learned JavaScript and Angular, and I have actually became a full-stack developer. And when I saw this picture, I really uh, understood what it means from trying to take the back-end perspective and ideas, uh, which mainly involves around functionality and try to implement the front end using these principles, the end result may be uh, not as friendly or uh, usable as you may want it to be. Take a look at this picture, for example. Um, it has all the functionality that uh, you want it to have, but the experience that it may leave with the users of it, it's not really um, usable or friendly as you'd like it to be. Uh, in many cases, when you're developing a backend or an API, you mostly thinking about the functionality, having all the main uh, functions that you like the API to support, but you rarely think about the experience of someone that integrates with your API, which is mostly the front-end developers, but basically anyone that integrates with the API. So let me share some uh, points and tips about how you can make the backend development uh, better and having a, an API that has uh, a better um, developer experience for anyone that integrates with your API and eventually create better products and make uh, product development faster. It's just the friction between the team and eventually deliver a better experience for the customer. So the first item I'd like to talk to you about is embedding. So, or how I'd like to call it, uh, how to avoid the horror of Chetty API. So this is an example of a cluster list. A cluster is basically a Kubernetes cluster or an OpenShift cluster in this case, which is uh, based on Kubernetes, and it has a few fields for it. Uh, in this table, it's uh, showing the cluster name on the left, the version, uh, which is basically the OpenShift version that this cluster is installed with, and the region on the right, which is the cloud provider region that this cluster is installed in. Now, at some point, the UX team came up with this idea, showing a small icon next to the version, indicating that this version has an available upgrade to it. And if you hover your mouse over that version, you will get a list of available upgrades. And if you click on it, you will get to the upgrade settings page. Now let's look at the backend and see how the API is uh, architected. So on the left side, uh, there's the cluster object. It has uh, several fields, for example, the name and the version and the region, of course. The version is an object that contains the ID and an href, which is a link. And if you get that link, you will get the version object on the right, which also contains the available upgrade list. So from the backend perspective, in order to support this new icon showing the available upgrade, all the client needs to do is for each cluster take the version of that cluster, get that specific version, and then extract the available upgrades from it. And the problem is that with a large set of clusters, let's say you have a list of 100 clusters, and potentially each one of them can be on a different OpenGIS version, that means the UI or the client needs to traverse uh, each cluster to get the available upgrades for that. And that eventually slows down the application, creates a network overload. It also uh, overloads the backend because uh, potentially every API call that the client is doing will require authorization and maybe a transaction to get that specific information from the database. So it's very uh, slow and um, there is the possibility of creating a non-responsive client if it's taking too long. So how can we solve it? 
So first, the definition. A chat API is one that requires a consumer to make a tremendous amount of distinct API calls to get the needed information about the resource. In this example, if the available upgrades included in the version and the client needs to get each version to get the list of available upgrades. So by using embedding, you can take the necessary fields, in this case, the available upgrades list, and embed them in the parent or the host object. In this case, it's the cluster. So by taking the available upgrades and provide them inside the versions object, which included in the cluster, you can have the available upgrades immediately when you get a cluster, but not only for a single cluster, but also for a list of clusters. In a traditional uh, relational database, that usually means some kind of a join between the clusters table and the version table. So it may be very efficient to do that this way instead of getting each version one at a time. Even if you're doing it concurrently, it will st still prevent, uh, take a time uh, and create a load. So in this way, we're avoiding it. I can also tell you that Netflix, for example, did a full redesign of their API just to avoid chattiness. Searchable API is another uh, item on the list. Um, in many cases, the front end will like to present searching, searching capabilities over a list of resources, which usually, usually means uh, filtering these objects. And filtering is very efficient on the backend side if you can filter specific resources that you like to see. But it's not only filtering, it's also sorting because if you searching for something, you'd like the results set to be in the same order every time you search this pattern and not show um, different ordering or sorting every time you search something. That may be uh, very confusing for the client if uh, you see different uh, result orders every time you search. But generation is also important usually because the client doesn't have anything to do with or doesn't like to get a large or too large amount of results, it may slow down the application again and blow up the memory eventually. So pagination is also important. And so you have to have all three in order to create a good experience on the front end side when searching items. A fast API, in many cases, uh, backend system tries to do uh, some operations that take longer than a few seconds and sometimes even longer than uh, a few minutes. And that slows down the response to the client side, which eventually creates a bad experience to the end user. And the front end developers will need to mitigate that, which creates another load on the, back -end on the front end developer as well. By uh, introducing some kind of an operation ID that the server or the backend can return, the client can pull that information and the server can make the long operation asynchronous from the API call. That can help reduce the amount of time that the client is waiting just to submit a single request. Error templates or how to avoid text parsing. So let's take this example. In this example, the server is returning an HTTP 400 error message, which says, uh, you do not have enough quota to scale up this cluster name as the end to end one cluster. You require 10 nodes of 5 M5 extra large instance type and 5 nodes of M5 2 extra large instance type. However, however, your current quota allows only, and there's a full specification of what's the missing quota here. Now, if you look at the backend side, this is perfect. This has all the information that tells you exactly what went wrong with the request and it tells you uh, or hints you how to uh, resolve it. Let's look at the UI design for that. Say you have this design, which is a window or modal uh, showing a title, a missing quota. On the left side, you can see a red icon, a red error icon. And the message says you do not have enough quota to scale up the SD end to end one cluster. And you can see the SD end to end one name is also a link. And if you click on it, you should be going to the cluster details page. On the bottom part, there's the exceeded resources part showing M5 XLR4 and M5 to XLR3. These are the exceeded resources for the quota. Now, if I'll try to create that design of an error message out of this string, I would have to parse this string, extract the necessary information out of it, and then present that to the user. And of course, 
how do I create the link to that cluster specifically? Well, it's complicated. And if I'll try to do that, it's not only complicated, but also very fragile. If anything will change in that error message, it will most likely break uh, this design uh, trying to parse that. So how can we solve it using error templates? The idea of error templates is taking the uh, interesting parts of the error message and make them fields. So for example, introducing a type of an error, like a quota error, can help the front end identify this specific error is about quota, which means the UI can do things like uh, decide on a specific design for it, maybe uh, some special icons that are related to quota errors. And there's the title, which is missing quota, which can be used so the type to be the title of that error message. And the message saying you do not have enough quota to scale up, and then an argument list with an index uh, of zero, which points you to the bottom part of this error message when uh, that value is uh, a name, uh, but also an address for a cluster, which means the front end can use that and present the name of the cluster, but also generate a link to that, which will take the client uh, to get to the cluster detail page. Also, there's a details part, uh, which is included as part of the code I.O., which includes the exceeded resources part. So that can be used to create the bottom part of this error message. Okay, let's move on. Validation. In many cases, when the client tries to submit a large amount of fields, which contain some object, to the backend, to the API, there's a lot of validation going on in backend. And in many cases, if there's, a, let's say, a string that shouldn't have a value, it's too, it may be too long or too short, uh, maybe has to be a, a number uh, no bigger than something or not negative. So there's a lot of validation going on in the backend. And if I'm trying to submit something and it fails on validation, I can fix that and try again. But then if I have a lot of fields and there's a lot of validation going on, it can take a while until uh, I can get it right. So that can create a very frustrating process for whoever integrates with the API. Including all validations in one response can help me by getting the entire set of errors that uh, failed on validation. I can fix that in one bulk and resend the request, which makes the development cycle a lot easier and faster. Using standard code is also important. You obviously are familiar with the 200 uh, code and the 400, uh, 500 around the uh, RESTful API, of course. But uh, nothing or not everything should be 200 or 400, for example. Let me give you an example. So let's say I'm trying to create a cluster and I'm posting to the cluster's endpoint. I'm providing a name and a version with ID 100, which doesn't really exist. So what happens if the backend returns an HTTP 404, which means no found, not found? Um, you may argue, well, the version doesn't really exist. Uh, I couldn't find it, so that's a reasonable status code. But according to the RFC, the URL itself that I'm trying to reach, in this case, the cluster's endpoint, when getting back a 404, it usually means for me that I'm trying to uh, contact an endpoint that doesn't really exist, or maybe I don't have enough permissions to get it or to use it. So in this case, uh, using or returning from the API an HTTP 400, is much more easier or much more explanatory than a 404. Okay, moving on. So good API is easy to learn and use, but this is the interesting part. It's also hard to misuse. And let me give you a short example. So let's say I'm trying to list clusters. I'm doing a get request on the clusters endpoint. And say I have over 3 million uh, clusters, and this is a real number from our system. That's a lot. That's potentially can uh, create a load on the client side and uh, of course on the network, but also on the backend side because it needs to serialize all this information and send it back to the client. By introducing a default, uh, you're helping the client from abusing the API. 
So that can really help and boost the performance of the application and avoid misuse of the API. Include links. I've uh, you've seen it in the examples before, but I like to emphasize it. So let's say I'm trying to get specific clusters and I'm doing a get on the clusters endpoint with an ID of a cluster, and then I'm getting back a name and a region, but the region itself contains minimal set of information. As a developer, if I'm getting an address, I immediately understand how can I get more information in the, about that specific region. So this really helps whoever integrates with your API uh, how to navigate through and get more information if required. Consistency. So please use the same casing and conventions throughout the API. So no mixing of ID and uh, or uppercase, lowercase, uh, small uh, snake case, for example. Just use the same convention throughout the API. Timestamp. Time use ISO 8601 and accept any time zone, but store it and return it in UTC. Units. Please use the same throughout the API and no mixing of, for example, if your API is using a storage system, don't try to mix bytes with gigabytes, terabytes, just use the same units for all the uh, values. If you'd like to learn more, I suggest you go uh, to this website, 100 days of DX, which is uh, short for developer experience.com. And I'll take any questions now.